Listen, once again, thank you so much. It's a great honor and privilege to be here. Uh, so my name is David Dominguez. My wife and I serve as U.S. missionaries in the city of Philadelphia, inner city of Philadelphia. And I just want to share this, that I believe this with all my heart. A lot of the inner cities in the U.S. are probably the most neglected mission fields in the world. And just to focus on Philly, I want to share this, that I don't know if you guys know this, but Philadelphia is number one in deep poverty among big cities. I don't know if you know that, but deep poverty is anything half of the poverty line. So you take a family of four could be earning somewhere around maybe $7,000 a year. Um, and that's what they're living off of. Addiction is very intense in Philadelphia. I don't know if you guys have heard of an area called Kensington. Uh, we actually reached Kensington. Kensington is an open air drug market. There's literally drug addicts using drugs out in the open. It's pretty intense. And I do have some pictures I'm gonna show you in a second. Um, childhood trauma is very intense. Listen, last year alone, there were over 50 children, youth, teens that were shot. Actually, 160. Was it 160? That were shot on the streets of Philadelphia. Think about that. A lot of these kids, they're walking to school thinking, could I get shot? They walk to the store thinking, could I get shot today? Uh, the shooting's there. It's an epidemic. It's sad. It's heartbreaking. Just to give you guys a better scope, and I don't want to bore you with numbers, but listen, crime in one year, 354 homicides, 6,100 robberies, 7,600 assaults, 6,900 burglaries, and 5,600 auto thefts. And I'm going to make a comment about abortion. Listen, I don't care what political line you stand on, but I believe this with all my heart, that abortion is murder. As a Bible-believing Christian, I believe that abortion is murder. In one year alone, get this, one year alone, in the whole state of Pennsylvania, there were about 31,000 abortions. Okay, in the whole state of Pennsylvania. In this city, Philadelphia, birthplace of our nation. Think about that. This is the birthplace of our nation. About 15,000 abortions. About 48% of those abortions were conducted right there in that city compared to the whole state. It's a city that's broken. It's a city that needs help. Um, there's a stat out there that 60% of children are raised fatherless. And I read these stats here that 63% of youth suicides come from fatherless homes. 90% of homeless runaway children come from fatherless homes. 85% of all children who show behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. And 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. And mind you, just 60% uh, is the dropout rate in certain neighborhoods. Um, I gave you some stats. I wanna show you guys some pictures just to give you a visual. Because a lot of times without seeing the things that go on there, in person, it's hard to even visualize this. So this is actually an open area, broad daylight. And I don't know if you know what this lady's doing, but she's smoking crack cocaine out in the open. And we just found this out that in order to arrest somebody with heroin or with drugs, actually with heroin in particular, you have to have more than 12 bags of heroin on you. So anything less, they'll just count as personal use. They won't even arrest you. Um, kids walk through here. Mothers push their stroller through here. This guy here out in the open, you could tell he shot up on his left arm there, setting up his needle. I mean, you see this in droves, blocks and blocks of people using. There's some more pics here. So the city, one of the city's ways to clean up the opioid epidemic, they put needle drop boxes out in the open. Mind you, again, I want to remind you of this. This is the birthplace of our nation, guys. Needle drop boxes everywhere. And we had a missions team that if you could hold that picture too. We had a missions team that uh, this one lady, uh, she, she mentioned something I never realized, that there's more needle caps on the floor than cigarette butts. And it just broke my heart to think and to see the birthplace of our nation in these conditions. The next picture here, you see a guy that he may be 30 something and he's just beat up with life. You know, I don't only see a guy that's addicted, but I see at one point this was a child, a young, kid with a God-given dream inside of him. He had purpose, he had destiny, and because of life, and because of abuse and whatever he went through, this is where he is now. There's some more pictures here. So we do outreaches at parks, and this is it. not only on the same day we found not only one needle uh, crack pipe, but there's another crack pipe. Same park, same day, where kids play. Most of the kids are unattended. They're about 95% 
are intended. This is another park that we reach on a weekly basis. These are opioid pills that we found right there where this guy's standing, man, right next to the park, if you want to. These are needles that we pick up every single week when we go out there, pick up dozens of needles. Actually, in our bus, we have one of those hazardous boxes that we carry. And just to show you, I don't know if you know what this is here. This is what we have to carry to every outreach we do. It's an overdose rescue kit, Narcam. And we got to carry this because we see many, many overdoses. Listen, right in parks, there's, there's another picture there. Right in parks where we reach kids, uh, we actually had to resuscitate a lady right there, right close to that park, uh, you know, on the park property because she was overdosed. And we see this every single time we go out, every single time we're reaching. And I just want to tell you that it hasn't been easy. You know, we've been in Philadelphia for about three and a half years, and God really taught us a couple valuable lessons that I want to share with you today because I don't want to just share what's going on, but I want to instill something in your hearts to really help you in this walk, in this Christian walk, and being the church. The first lesson that we learned is this, that it's, it's, it's what to do in the process. What do we do in this process? Because everyone here is in a process, no matter how young or how old, we're all in a process, right? And I believe that God has taught us this through a man by the name of Apostle Paul, a guy that I love. I love reading about him. I love sharing about him. But Apostle Paul, he had a dream. And his dream was to go to, uh, to, to Rome to preach the gospel. And this didn't happen right away. It took about three, three years for him to get to Rome, but he didn't go as a tourist. He didn't go as an evangelist. He actually went as a prisoner. And you know, let me ask you this what happens when you're desiring something? You have a dream for something, and your reality doesn't meet your dream. What happens when your reality that, that you're believing God for, and it just doesn't come forth, man? And I believe Paul taught us something great about this. You know, he was so eager to go to Rome that he even spoke this. He said, uh, he wrote this in Romans 1.15. He said, uh, eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. And, you know, it took him some time to get there. But I want to kind of speak to you about Romans 12, about this process, what we could do to learn, and uh, really what we have to do in that process. And the first thing I want to share this is sacrifice. Because we as Christians, we have to sacrifice, man. We have to live life very sacrificially. He actually started this book, I mean this chapter, like this. He said, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. You know, that, that word even, it's an oxymoron to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Because back then in the Old Testament, we might think sacrifices, maybe sacrificing time, maybe sacrificing money, sacrificing something. But really, the, Paul's speaking about to live dead is what he's saying. He's saying to, to live your life as if you don't even, you're not even alive, man. That's what he's talking about. You know, we live our lives so many times that we seek things to really, for our pleasures. And, you know, it's, it's cool. You know, I'm fine. We like doing things. My wife and I like going out and things like that. But a lot of times we don't like to sacrifice. We don't like to live dead. And I'm going to tell you, as a Christian, in the process that we're going through, living our lives, whatever you're going through, man, the process, we got to learn how to sacrifice. Because I'm going to tell you this, in this process, your family might get attacked. Your finances may get attacked. Your, your life may get attacked. Your health might get attacked. But if you're living dead, what could the enemy do to you? You know, the enemy could attack and you could still keep coming to church. You could still keep on inviting people to church. You could continue to tithe and sow and give to missions. Why? Because that's what God called us to do, man. And this is something that I feel so really just fired up about. Because a lot of times we don't want to sacrifice. The second thing he said is this. He said uh, not to, to conform to God and not to good. Let me tell you, sometimes there are things that seem good and we want to conform to those things and conform to maybe society or even the way this culture is. Sometimes things that are good might not be God. This is what he said. He said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, perfect will of God. And he says this, he said, uh, in 1212, he said, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, and be persistent in prayer. And what does it even mean to rejoice in hope? In Hebrews 1.11, it says this, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Meaning whatever you desire, whatever you're believing for, whether it's that person that you're praying for to come to Christ or whether it's that building program to get paid off or whatever it is that, that you're believing so you could do more ministry. In that waiting, in that suffering, we just believe and we rejoice that God is going to take care of everything that we need. You know, in the Bible, in Psalms, it says this, that your word is a light to guide my feet and a light for my path. It says it's, it's a lamp for my feet. It's not a spotlight. A lot of times God gives us segments and small little pieces of things and we want to just get ahead of God. We've got to learn how to suffer and just wait and just understand that God has everything that we desire, everything that we dream in his hands, man. I don't know if you've noticed this, and my wife could tell you this, but, man, I'm a very passionate person. I love the things of God. I'm passionate about the things of God. I'm passionate about my wife, man, passionate about our team, passionate about the things of God and the, what God is doing in the city of Philadelphia. I'm going to tell you this, man. If you've been old enough, you know that passion could get you in trouble. Passion could take you places you don't want to go. Because passion is really an emotion. You know, passion could get your marriage in trouble. It could, if you're in school, it could really mess up your grades because you're passionate more about other things. Even the Word of God, just seeking this walk, man, and your passion could get you in trouble. And Benjamin Franklin said this. He said, if passion drives you, let reason be the rain. Galatians 5.24 says this, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions. And I'm going to be honest with you, man. These three and a half years that we've been here in the city of Philadelphia, we've, we've gone through a lot, man. Our passion drove us here. We were full of zeal. And I know God called us here. But within the first year, my father-in-law, that was like a father to me because I didn't really have much family, man. My family are you guys. You guys are my uncles and aunts and grandfathers and brothers and sisters. I don't, I don't really have family in that way besides my wife and my kids and our team. Man, my father-in-law, within that first year, he fell, hit his head. It accelerated his Alzheimer's, and he passed away, and we were in hospice as we witnessed. I hope that's Jesus. I'm just going <laughs> And, you know, we, we watched him as the life got sucked out of him. And it was hard on us within the first year. And not only were we dealing the change of culture, which culture, they say, the change of culture, it's similar to, to losing a loved one. It takes that whole year process, but then my father-in-law dies. And a dog that we had for four years, if you're a cat lover, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. But we had this dog, Boston Terrier, great dog, and we loved him, and it got hit by a car by these young people. And I, I saw as they drove off, they were driving off laughing. And then our house got broken into, a house that we were renovating. They ripped it out, stripped the house, man. And it just really hurt us because we ran it through the insurance company, and the insurance company said, well, you don't have vacant insurance. So they didn't even cover it. About $10,000 lost there. And then our cars got broken into. My son got stuck up at gunpoint. My other son got jumped. We had attack from our family. And we had these seasons where you feel like the devil threw everything at you, man, except the kitchen sink. And one day I wake up and look, and here comes the kitchen sink. <laughs> and I'm telling you, days like that, it'll take your passion and it'll disintegrate it. And it'll take it into nothing. Something that God taught us through this process is that when passion fades, the call sustains. And in 1 Peter, he said this, that they, um, make your call and election sure for if you practice these things, you'll never stumble. 
I'm going to tell you this, there's going to be a day in this Christian walk that you're going to feel like so, pre- so much pressure, you're not going to want to come to church, man. You're going to be so weighed down with issues that you're not going to want to invite people to church. There's going to be a day that, you, you know, your finances are maybe under attack that you don't want to tithe or give to missions. But guess what? That's our call as the body of Christ, man. That's something that we're called to do, to live this life. Sowing things into missions and into tithe and building funds. So let me tell you, the things that we see here today, it's not going to last long. You know, we came from a great church, man. We came from a, actually a very tiny church, about 4,000 members. <laughs> Calvary, actually Calvary Christian Center in Ormond Beach. Pastor Jim Raley, great church. If you guys are ever on vacation out there, go check it out. Similar to this. You know, we were... We were there and our home church pastor, he told us before we left, he said, why don't you plant near us? He said, we have the resources, we have the people. And and we just felt that call and we came and, you know, after all this mess that kept happening to us, man, we honestly, we felt and we thought about even going back to Florida. We thought about it. Because it was hard. Sometimes you got to push through. And we've been there for three and a half years. And after that first year, we started this Sidewalk Sunday School site. Who knows what Sidewalk Sunday School is? Oxymoron, not on side. <laughs> it's not on the sidewalk or on Sunday. But we, we go into these parks and reach kids in very intense neighborhoods. Within that first year, we met, actually that first day, we met a girl by the name of Sam. And Sam is an amazing girl. We love her. She was with us yesterday. And Sam, I knew she was a long-lost daughter because she walked by and she looked at me. And she said, that beard looks uncomfortable. I can't even see your neck. And then she walks off and I said, yeah, that's my long-lost daughter right there. I knew it. And so Sam, she comes from a very intense background, man. Her mother's a heroin addict. She's addicted. Her father's in prison for horrific crime. And she's in foster care with her grandmother in kinship care, lives right across the street from this park. This park, they, it's called McPherson Park, but they call it Needle Park because there's so much addiction and so much needles there. And, you know, last summer she stayed with us the whole summer and we're hosting all these short-term mission teams. We're going out, raising up an army to go out to the city, reach people. And one day during worship, I remember watching her and she's in the back. She has her hoodie up and she has her arms crossed. And I said, Holy Spirit, please reach her. Penetrate her heart, God. And I remember that same day, the grandmother came out and spoke to my wife as we're doing an outreach there. And she said, hey, Sam came home super excited. She was ecstatic. She's saying, oh, I'm learning all this about missions and outreach and evangelism. She said, I wonder if I'm going to end up becoming a missionary. I mean, just to think, what if we would have gave up? What if we would have left? I just want to go back to the basics that, listen, man, when Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, he's not speaking to single women to get you a husband. He's not talking about that. So, Toya, calm down, girl. I know you're, <laughs> we have a Bible college and she's, she's one of the Bible college students and I know she's been, she's like ring before spring and she calls it bridal college. She's just believing. <laughs> And it's talking about being a soul winner. It's saying, you know what, if you follow me, a byproduct of following me as you're walking with me, I'm going to make you a soul winner. That's our call as the church, man. Our call as the church is to win souls. You, you probably hear a lot of missionaries use this verse in Acts 1.8. But I, I want to really see it from a different angle. And this scripture is actually a record before Jesus sent it up to heaven. And I love this because prior to Jesus sending up, Uh, The disciples gathered around and they said, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Jerusalem? And in that time, Jerusalem was similar to Philadelphia. There was corruption in government. There was brokenness. There was poverty. It was just messed up. This is what Jesus said, and I love this so much. Because he said, right, this is his response. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. He's saying, you know what? He's given us the opportunity and the privilege. Because it is a privilege it's a privilege, man, 
to sow into missions. It's a privilege to invite people to church. It's a privilege to tithe. It's a privilege to give to the building fund. It's a privilege to all do all these things. That God in a second could change this world. But I had his grace, man. He's waiting on certain people to turn and repent. And he's using us to be that voice, to be that hand, to be the hands and feet, man, of Christ. I mean, it's a privilege that we get. And I love it so much that it's something we don't have to do. It's something we, we get to do. And within that first year, we started this um, sidewalk Sunday school site, and then we started a homeless feeding, VIP Homeless feeding, there's a couple more pictures here where we call it our VIP ministry where we feed homeless people. There's, there's some more here, and we go out there to Kensington. These are mission teams that we host that come out and serve with us. And we, we started evangelism, and we go out evangelizing, and we started an adopt-a-block where we clean up streets and things like that. There's some more pics here, I believe, maybe. Yeah, we started a, a human trafficking ministry where... We have a group of girls that go into the strip club to minister to the girls. They were actually there this last Friday. It's once a month. They go in there, leave gift baskets for the girls, pray for the girls. And then we walk up and down Kensington Ave giving out gift baskets and bags for the girls. You, you could back that up for a second. So we, we're, we're super excited. And we started this, uh, yeah, if you could forward, we're building out this food truck, man. And I'm excited about it. It's going to be a fully equipped food truck with a five-foot griddle two fryers, a, a burner top, a hot table, hot cabinet, freezer. You can keep going. Those are the propane tanks here. Pastor Pedro right there, yeah, in the window. And we, we, we already stripped it down. We painted it, and we're going to get it wrapped. There's some more pics here, I believe. Boom, right there. We're going to put lighting and speakers so we can preach the gospel right from that truck as we're feeding. And the goal with this truck, praise God, the goal with this truck we're going to park it, park it outside of schools, and as kids come out, we're going to give them a hot meal. So our goal is to do about 300 meals a day. That's minimum. We believe we could surpass that because, you know, standing outside of schools with 600 students, we could probably do so many more, you know, as kids are dismissed. And, so it's, so, and then we're also going to feed the homeless with it. And it's a privilege to serve God. We'll go back to this picture in a sec. I just want to give you guys this quick analogy that I saw this illustration that I saw some time ago and I've been using for a while. And I just love it because when I saw this, it brought things into perspective even for my own life. And I want you to picture this rope here as if it's a rope that's, this is a timeline of your life, okay? Okay. Picture it as the t a timeline of your life and, and just picture it, even though it stops right there, it goes on forever, it wraps around the whole universe millions upon millions of times because our lives are eternal. We live this life forever. You know, when we die, it's not over. We cross over and we live millions upon millions upon millions of years. And I want you to picture this small little red speck here as the timeline of your life right here. So many times we focus so much on this small speck. We focus and we think, you know, about things that don't matter and about education, which we're all about education. You know, we, we have a Bible college, like I mentioned. I believe you're, you might start one here. I'm not sure. But you know, we think about things about retirement, about getting a bigger house and a better car and nicer shoes and nicer clothes. We forget that there's going to be a day that we cross over. And everything that we own here in this earth, man, everything that we have, it's going to be the same as when you own things as a, as a child. You don't remember those things. Those shoes that you wore, man, they wore out. The cars that you drove when you were younger, they broke down. And the things that only matter are the things that we're going to be able to cross eternity with. And that's souls. What you invest in the kingdom is what matters. So many times we focus on that small little speck of life and we forget that we're eternal beings. There's going to be a day that we're going to cross over and it's going to be done. Let me tell you something. It's never a waste of time to invite someone to church or preach the gospel. 
I promise you this, Pastor Ryan, man, he'll preach the gospel. If you feel nervous or, or scared to preach, just, just invite him. Invite him. It's never a wasted dollar when you give in submissions. It's never a wasted dollar when you tithe or give to a building fund. It's never a waste of time. So let me tell you this, that if God put a little girl on one side from either Africa or India or the Philippines or South America or Kensington that's been abused and has been broken, maybe sold into human trafficking, and then you take all the currency on the other side and of the whole world, all the silver, all the gold, every dollar, and you put it on the other side. I'd always choose that little girl. And it's not, God cares about people. And although we're setting up all these outreaches and getting ready to launch this food truck in March, and it's all about people. I want to share one more story about a guy named Antoine. It's the last picture there, I believe, with the team. This is Antoine right here. Say hi, Antoine. Let me tell you something about Antoine. I met Antoine when we were doing an outreach, and... Antoine was mad at the world, mad at me because I was part of the church. And Antoine, he, he was just belligerent, yelling at me, cursing at me. And Antoine, he, uh, once he calmed down, I asked him, I said, hey, is there anything I could do for you? And this is what he said. He said it very angry. He said, yeah, get me some ice cream. That's what he told me. I said, all right, Antoine, let's go get some ice cream. So I walk over the cross street. We get some ice cream. As he's standing there with his mint chocolate chip ice cream, he's a little bit calmer. And I say, Antoine, is there anything else I could do for you? He says, yeah, um, I need some clothes, man. So we drive over to the center. It's around 6.30. By this time, we're tired. We drive over there, you know, get back. You know, part of me just wanted to go home and just relax, but I knew that this was important. And I sat with Antoine and asked Antoine, hey, what's your story, man? And he tells me, he said, my mother was a heroin addict from as long as I could remember. And he said, she used to set up her heroin in front of me. And my father, between age 8 to 13, sexually abused me. That's what Antoine said. And he said that it changed the way I view life. It changed the way I view everything. And he said, at 13 years old, I was tired of my father doing this to me, that I, I set up my needle for the first time and I shot heroin for the first time at 13 years old, is what he told me that day. And he said, I've been hooked ever since. And we took him to the center and we were hanging out with him, talking with him. And he said, hey man, if I get clean, could I work with you guys? And right now he's still struggling, but let me tell you something. This was a man at one point with a God-given dream. This was a man that, that had a heart and a desire for something in the things of God. And I'm going to share this real quick. My God-given dream is this. Not only to have food trucks throughout the city, not only to do these great things that are going to reach people because it's about people, it's not about things. My God-given dream is to have a 24-hour church where we could house people where we could house women rescued from human trafficking, where we could house girls that are pregnant in the foster care system so they don't abort the baby or, or give up the baby because they, they say that most of the big uh, girls in foster care system, they get pregnant, they have to give the babies up for foster care. So it's additional trauma. That's our God-given dream, man, to have a 24-hour church because if the drug dealers don't sleep, if the human traffickers don't sleep, if poverty never sleeps, you know what? The church should never sleep either. Amen. I just want to pray for you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Father, I just lift up each person in here, God. God, and I just pray, God, that if there's any fear, God, to evangelize or, or to go out, Father, and do things, God, extraordinary, God, things that are beyond there, personality or emotions or thought process or even if their passion has faded, God. Father, I pray, God, that you would fill them today, God, with power, with strength, Father. With an anointing from you, God. Use them, Father, for your purpose, God. Guide them and direct them, God. And I pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's give him a hand one time. Thank you. Wow, it looks familiar to Calvary, doesn't it? The outreaches we're doing, the things we're doing down in the city. And uh, church, we want to sow into, into this ministry. And so we're going to take an offering. We're going to take a love offering for them to help them out today. And um, man, thank you for the eye-opening visuals of what's going on in the birthplace of our nation. And uh, we, need a, we need to support you and help you. We're going to pray for you. Uh, so ushers, when you're ready, come on down. And uh, I'm, we're going to pray at the end here for them as a whole. So when you guys are ready, you can come down. But thank you so much for revealing and being open to share what you've been going through. It's not an easy task. It's not an easy task. Go ahead, ushers, because I'm going to pray for them as a team. And David, could you bring your team up here? We're going to run this around them in prayer. If you need to give online later, if you, don't, you, know, if you need to do that, you can get go to calvarydover.org backslash give or forward slash give. And we have the push pay online giving you can do to help them out. ushers came to you, would you stand together as, as they're coming back and moving back? We're going to stand together. We're going to join in prayer here. extend some hands out to them. And God, we thank you for planting this family in Philly. God, we ask for your power, the power of your Holy Spirit to be upon every single team member. Lord, we ask that you would move by your spirit, Lord, that you would give them, Lord, the power to perform miracles signs and wonders, Lord. God, I pray you would multiply, Lord, every dollar, every sandwich, every bowl of soup, every supply, God. God, be their provision. When it seems like there is no way, be their way. God, we thank you for their sacrifice, God. Thank you, Lord, for the inspiration. Lord, that when the passion fades, the calling sustains. Lord, we thank you that you led the way on that cross. Lord, that you took the nails and you were pierced by your side for us because you were called to that cross. You were willing to suffer for us, God. Your son, Jesus, inspires us, Lord, and teaches us how to live this life. We thank you, God, that, Lord, you're going to sustain the Dominguez family and you're going to sustain this church and this team. God, I pray you grant every dream that you've given them, Lord. God, I pray you provide for them, not just the finances, but the people to do this huge dream. God, I pray that we would be the church that never sleeps. God, I pray that you would grant that dream and that vision for them. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your protection. And Lord, I pray that your gospel would penetrate the hearts of every soul who hears the words coming from the microphones and the Sunday school truck and the, and the food truck and everything that's going on out there, God, every ministry they do to every person, 
God, I pray that they would see the love of Jesus and hear the gospel. And may your spirit sink that seed of truth right into their hearts so they would believe in Jesus Christ and be transformed forever. God, we thank you for your anointing upon this team. Do mighty and great things. We know you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God.